Welcome to KRQE's New Mexico News Insiders. Here's Gabrielle Burkhart and Chris McKee. My only disappointment is we don't know still why he has done that. That question of why is one the brother of Muhammad Afzal Hussein says still haunts him after his brother's killer, Muhammad Syed, recently took a plea deal for shooting and killing two men last summer. It's a case we've been following from the beginning, and recently it's come to somewhat of a closing chapter. While there are families who feel like they got some justice, there are others who still are left with major questions. Questions about the criminal investigation, the court process, and questions about why their loved one was killed in the first place. We, of course, are talking about the case involving Mohammed Syed, a man at the center of a series of mysterious murders at the time, and still somewhat, involving Muslim men in Albuquerque. The victims were gunned down seemingly at random across July and August of 2022. Fast forward two years to summer of 2024, here we are now. As Gabby mentioned, Syed just took a plea deal for the two remaining killings he was facing trial for months after being convicted in one murder case. Later on, we'll talk to attorney Ahmad Assad. He's not involved with the case, but he's a prominent representative of the Albuquerque Muslim community and an expert in the law. First, today we're joined by Natalie Wattis, our KRQE News 13 reporter, to talk about the Syed case, which you covered. Natalie, thanks for being here. Gabby, Chris, thank you for having me. We appreciate you being here and uh, know that we wanted to talk to you because you have a, a good connection with the uh, criminal side of this and how these things played out in court. Yeah, so before we start, let's just recap a little bit of the story here briefly. Originally, a refugee from Afghanistan, Muhammad Syed, was living in Albuquerque for about five to six years before these cases unfolded. He was arrested in August 2022 and charged with three murders. That includes the killing of 41-year-old Aftab Hussein in July 2022, the August killings of 27-year-old Muhammad Afzal Hussein, and 25-year-old Naeem Hussein. So Natalie, briefly, for those who maybe don't know you, because sometimes we know our podcast listeners don't always catch our newscasts in different ways, but um, you are a general assignment reporter here at KRQE, responsible for shooting all of your stuff. You've been here for about two and a half years. Um, And to start, as I mentioned, you covered the first murder trial here in March. That trial ended with the conviction of Mohammed Syed for one count of first-degree murder after just two hours of jury deliberations, but several days of trial. Uh, what do you remember of that trial, the arguments, the verdict? What, what was it like being in that courtroom? Right. Uh, that deliberation was very quick. It was four days of uh, witness testimony. I think there were roughly 20 witnesses that we heard from, experts, uh, everything from cell phone data analysts to firearms experts. Um, What stood out about this case was kind of this overarching question that we never had answered, and that was, why did he do this? Prosecutors never went into what the motive was, never went into whether it was targeted or random. They purely focused on connecting Syed to the scene and connecting him to the gun. Yeah. It's a really curious thing because I've covered a few different trials and it's always in that opening statement. There's at least somewhat of a discussion of the motive. And here, to your point, there was never any of that. Right. It was completely absent. The prosecution, uh, their main goal, it seemed in this case, was, like I said, to put Syed at the scene of the crime. And interestingly, they did that by using cell phone data uh, where his cell phone pinged based on cell phone towers to put him, to kind of triangulate his movements and put him at the scene of the crime at the time of the shooting. And also, there was a note entered into his notes app in his phone just minutes before the shooting where he said he would, quote, test his AK-47. And that was really some of the most compelling evidence that the prosecution mentioned. They the, have, oh, sorry. They also talked about like his, his weapons and stuff, right? Right. They, they went into weapons that were found in his home. We had testimony from the people that sold him the AK-47. I f- believe it was weeks before this. That was a major component as well. 
You mentioned the deliberation was short. How short did the jury deliberate before convicting him? It was about two hours. Yeah. Okay. So two hours is, um, you know, sometimes we have seen convictions come usually after, uh, sometimes it can be a whole day of deliberations, um, but two hours is a pretty short window of time, especially once it was preceded by about four days, I think, as you said, of testimony. Right, four days, four full days of testimony. It was beginning, I believe, around eight or nine in the morning and going until about four or five. So after that first conviction, we know Syed was then awaiting sentencing in the first case and awaiting trial for two additional murders. So that second trial was about to start, then suddenly it was canceled. We heard of a court hearing for a plea deal, which you covered as well. What was it like in that courtroom? That is the plea hearing for a man now facing two murders. Right. It was... Obviously very solemn. These are serious charges that he was facing. I will say up until the end, though, there was a sense of not quite knowing how it was going to play out. It seemed when we first got into the courtroom that both sides had their plea agreement pretty much ironed out. But there was a moment when the judge was reading the terms of the agreement back to Syed, and everything is happening through a translator. So the judge would read the terms, translator would translate it and Syed would respond in the affirmative. The translator would translate it back to her. So it was sort of a long process there. But when the judge got to a portion where she was reading to Syed about the rights that he was giving up in taking this plea agreement of no contest, she got to a portion, do you understand you're giving up the right to a speedy trial? Do you understand you're giving up the right to plead innocence in this case? And there was some confusion about that. Syed told his translator, or at least we heard this through the translator, that he didn't really understand that part. He needed to speak with his lawyers about it. So the judge paused the proceedings at that point, and I believe it was for about an hour, defense left with Syed, and we're sitting in the gallery waiting, not quite knowing what was going to happen. I will say I was sitting next to the brother of one of the victims, um, Muhammad Afzal Hussein, the brother of Muhammad Afzal Hussein, and the prosecution came over to him and began to explain, this is uh, prosecuting attorney Jordan Machen, and she began to explain to him what would happen in the event that Syed decided to reject this plea agreement. She was telling him if he rejects it, they would go to trial, but they couldn't go to trial that day because we didn't have a jury. So really up until the last moments, we were just waiting to see how this two-year saga was really going to wrap up. Wow. Yeah, it goes to show you, even when those hearing dates are set for a specific topic, they they can um, go different directions. They can take a left turn that maybe we're not expecting, and things don't always happen as planned, especially in the courtroom. So the plea did, though, happen as planned. Uh, We're talking about Syed pleading no contest to two counts of second-degree murder. So for each of those convictions, he gets 15 years in prison. So as a total for those two cases, that's 30 years, right, for two no-contest pleas for two counts of second-degree murder. As part of the agreement, though, Syed will serve the 30 years for those murders At the same time, he is expected to serve his first sentence for the first murder case. Yeah, so in the most basic sense, to boil it down, he's looking at 30 years in prison. So he will be 83 years old before he could try for parole. Um, District Attorney Sam Bregman said at the time, quote, he will never walk out of prison. So Natalie, tell us, why did prosecutors say they wanted to cut this deal? Well, Prosecutors said something very similar. I caught up with one of the prosecuting attorneys, Jordan Machen, after the plea agreement was reached. And she said, like I mentioned, something very similar. She said, uh, Syed will never walk the streets of Albuquerque again. He'll be behind bars. She also mentioned that they had an enormous amount of evidence. And in reaching this agreement, they're sparing the families of these victims a possibly long and painful trial of rehashing all of these details. I also caught up with the defense afterwards and asked, how did we get here? And they mentioned it was Syed, their client, Muhammad Syed, was facing essentially 90 years behind prison. And, and facing that sentence, they felt it was in the best interest of their client to reach this 30-year agreement that would run at the same time as the 30-year life sentence for the first conviction of first-degree murder. 
And at least that conviction, they told me, had the possibility of parole. Yeah, and we should add that uh, the automatic conviction by statute for a first-degree murder case is already 30 years, at least 30 years in prison, and then a possibility of parole. So that's what he was guaranteed to look at, even though he hasn't been technically sentenced in that first case. That's what he was guaranteed to be looking at. Um, And so then this deal is reached. And so, yes, to your point, they all kind of run at the same time and... Um, you know, one of his defense attorneys, Tom Clark, sort of saying the fact that he would be 83 when he got out, he saw it a little differently from the prosecution, seeing that, you know, there is still a chance that he perhaps would be able to serve some sort of parole um, in his lifetime. Right. And I think it's also important to reiterate that there's no possibility of uh, parole on the two second degree murder charges. So one of the things that's left over with this case is the lack of answers. You heard that from the brother of one of the victims immediately after this plea hearing. Tell us more about that conversation with the victim's brother. Right. So that would be Muhammad Imtiaz Hussein, who is the brother of Muhammad Afzal Hussein, who was one of Muhammad Zayed's August murders. Um, Catching up with him after the hearing... He said, I asked him if he felt that if justice was served, and he said he believed it was. He said he was okay with the plea hearing because Syed would remain behind bars. He mentioned that because New Mexico has no capital punishment, that this is the maximum sentence that he could get, that he at least got that for one of the charges, and he would stay behind bars. He mentioned that he was a prosecutor in Pakistan before he came to the United States, and he was very pleased with the work that the prosecution had done in this case. But as far as the lack of answers, I know that was also something he he emphasized, right? Definitely. He said while this punishment would hopefully deter others who may have a similar mindset or want to take similar actions that Syed did and in killing his brother and his victims, he mentioned that he will never know why Syed did this. He he was at every proceeding, every hearing. And he said for two years, he's been looking for answers and trying to find out why his brother was killed. And it's something we may unfortunately never know. And we know amid all of these court hearings so far, um, Syed has yet to say a thing. Um, He has yet to address um, any of this. He didn't testify on his own behalf in his first trial. And uh, again, he hasn't been sentenced. Usually there is an opportunity there for the um, defendant to say their piece to the courts, but um, we'll see if that happens. So far, it's been silent in that realm. Um, Natalie, we appreciate you joining us. Um, Is there anything else that you wanted to add about what it was to cover these cases? Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, It's been a pleasure to talk about this and share, you know, details that the public may not have otherwise heard about. I think it was just a difficult case to cover, sitting in the courtroom and hearing about these horrific things that have happened when you have family members sitting next to you who are trying to process grief and trauma and having to hear about this as well was difficult. But, um, you know, it gives you a firsthand view of how justice works in our state. Yeah. Well, Natalie Wattis, thank you so much for joining us. And hopefully this won't be your last on the podcast. I hope not either. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back with more of the New Mexico News Insiders. KRQE News 13 Investigations, one of the biggest cons in New Mexico history. How did they get away with it? Well, they had an accomplice, the state of New Mexico. A road rage encounter leads to murder. I miss him every single day. Did the judicial system fail here? New Mexico's families, homes and lives are left in ashes. There's a level of anxiety. FEMA has been an abject and abysmal failure. Watch anytime on krqe.com or our YouTube channel. So we are back this time with Ahmad Assad, a longtime criminal defense attorney here in New Mexico. And also for our longtime listeners, you may recall Ahmad was a strong voice for the Muslim community as president of the Islamic Center when these mysterious murders were happening in the summer of 2022. You've also been on our show. So thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you. I love being on your show. And thank you for the invite. You're welcome. Well, so that was two years ago now that we had you here. It's hard to believe it was two years ago to talk about just how much fear these killings were sparking in the community at the time. 
Albuquerque was thrust into the national spotlight when these men were gunned down days apart, seemingly at random. Tell us briefly, if you can recall, what was the sentiment that summer? Oh, I, would, I, I don't think the sentiment is ever going to be f- forgotten by the community. It, it was an incredibly dark time in the Muslim communities, that timeline for m- members of the Muslim community, I should say. And there was a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, um, a lot of need to know. And um, there was some chaos um, and people just didn't know uh, with clarity and direction what their next step is in terms of their lives. So it was a very upsetting, unraveling part of their lives. And uh, I remember the communities acting irrationally and all in the context of trying to stay safe. People moved away from the state. I remember that. People uh, stopped going to prayers. People stopped being um, uh, socialized with one another so that they were not targeted as Muslims. They stayed home. They tried to avoid being in vehicles. All measures were taken in their own minds to isolate themselves and distance themselves from either being noticed as members of the faith or otherwise, because we didn't know where the the next victim was going to be. Yeah, and it, it seemed like it was one of those moments where minds were running wild because there, at the time, was no suspect identified, and you know your mind runs as to who is doing this and why, right. and and are you know are we being targeted as a community right. um, for any specific reason? It, it, is that that's a very good. I mean, I mean. As, you, as we speak about it, and as I sit here today, I remember these, these sentiments, and you bring up a really good point. And a lot of conversation in the community centered on, you know, the motivation. Who would have been? Is it, a, is it, is it you know, the, a particular segment in community, a, per, a, a particular religious fanatic, or is it, within, you know, is it within closer uh, members is it a personal conflict? Is it so? There's a lot of things running through, and there was generalized concern about a you know a hate crime uh, motivating uh, you know the, uh, the the crime itself and the homicides. So, but we were very careful, and I remember distinctly having conversation with the board and the members of the community, and trying to, and even the media, trying to keep the idea that we're not we don't know who it is, and I think it's very proper for us to not come to conclusions. And, uh, you know, it was with good reason, obviously, that we did that. Yeah. I want to drill in a little bit more on that point of of why. Um, APD and the FBI said back then that they couldn't call these killings a hate crime because they didn't have a motive or they didn't know who the killer was. We remember APD Commander Kyle Hartsock, he said at the time, quote, while we won't go into all the specifics of why we think that, there is one strong commonality with the victims, the race and religion. Now that we know who the killer is, Muhammad Syed, also a member of the Muslim community here locally, uh, it, it seems like we still don't really understand his motive, though, behind this. Um, what have you learned about this case and the why surrounding it? Are you at a loss like many of the rest of us are? Uh, I, I think I am. Uh, to, to, in summary, yes. But I, there are, it's, it's more nuanced with respect to kind of levels of, of um, motivation. So we've heard them all, right? Um, people have reported, New York Times reported that there was some kind of rift between, they, they, they reported the idea that there could have been a Shiite Sunni rift. Uh, there are people that t- talked about the fact that um, there was a problem with regards to his daughter marrying outside of her religion. Uh, we, we heard uh, issues involving his difficult persona and getting along with people, and that permeated across lines, whether you're Shiite, Sunni, Christian, Arab, Muslim, otherwise. He had a, apparently a very difficult uh, uh, personality at times with people that have come forward. So there was a multitude of characteristics that were being investigated to try to put together a pattern of some sort uh, to draw up this person's uh, individual thinking. I don't think that the legal process at this point has led us in any way to resolve that issue to the satisfaction of either the families of the of the victims or, quite frankly, the 
inner community, of the Muslim community, or the outer community. We don't know the why. And uh, I can tell you that we probably don't know the why because it may be something that is individualized. It could literally be someone that has no specific pattern with respect to the homicides, and there could be different reasons for the homicides that he's been convicted of. And I know that there's other investigations that have gone on, and uh, I won't comment at this time about those because I have my limited knowledge, but we can talk generally maybe later about those. But as far as the three homicides that he either was convicted of or took a plea to, it is odd because one is a Sunni Muslim, the other two are of the Shiite faith, uh, and um, we know that at least the larger uh, story about a rift doesn't fit. And the, they're not related, right? No, not, not, not related at all. It, factually, uh, f- as a matter of uh, knowledge to the public, these folks don't have a bloodline. Uh, the decedents, the victims, are not related in any way whatsoever. Even socially, I don't believe that they are connected uh, with one another to establish some sort of either friendship or some group that may have had some interactions that were negative with Mr. Syed. Ultimately, Muhammad Syed will serve time for those three murders, that is the killing of Aftab Hussein, Muhammad Afzal Hussein, and Naeem Hussein, all of which are unrelated, as we mentioned. That's correct. But our investigative colleague here at KRQE, Ann Peret, she recently reported that Syed was also investigated for two other murders and a drive-by shooting. Anne spoke to the brother of Muhammad Zahir Ahmadi, who was shot and killed while smoking a cigarette outside that family's market eight months before Syed was arrested. Hadi says he immediately recognized Syed's name and face, explaining he and his brother had run-ins with Syed and his wife at their store. When I came, the last time I talked with him, I told him go, and then I called the cops. The cops didn't come, didn't show up. His family cited run-ins with Syed at their store, and he they felt confident that he was the killer. Then unsealed federal court documents also revealed Syed was under investigation for the murder of a Chinese woman who was killed around the same time as the other murders in July of 2022. And investigators, for the record, cannot say that Syed is considered a suspect in those murders, only that there are still open investigations. So my question to you is, have you spoken with any of those other families, and can you speak to their efforts to find closure? I have not recently, because it's a matter of probably natural investigations taking place since 2022, but I have not spoken recently. I do know that with the Halal Market shooting, briefly uh, engaged in conversation with the brother uh, and that there were ongoing investigations related to that shooting. And they were pretty confident, kind of trying to align the, uh, the shooting with Mr. Syed. Of course, federal authorities have a more, much more deeper uh, sense of the investigation and are probably not vocal at all about how they intend and what's going on with regards to the investigation. So all I can say is if, in fact, Mr. Syed was involved in that, it clearly reflects a multiple interactions. We can conclude, I think, safely that there may be personality conflicts or personal conflicts that may have related to that incident, assuming that he's ultimately a target and is charged. Um, but, you know, in 2022, I remember there was some more confidence than there is today with respect to identifying Mr. Syed as, the, as a potential suspect with regards to that case. But as I understand it here, he's not even labeled officially as a suspect in that nonsense. Correct. Yeah. So we know that Mr. Syed will serve at least 30 years in prison at this point after the conviction in the first murder. Um, and then as well, this plea deal puts him in a position where he is um, serving another 15 years for the second murder and 15 years for the third murder. Mm-hmm. And that sentence for those second and third cases will run at the same time as the first one. So he will serve at least 30 years in prison. That's right. Do you believe justice has been served in this case? You know, it's, it's literally, that's a question for the families, I think, more than anything else. If you will, as a member of the community, and a larger community, a member of the legal community, um, I feel like that, uh, depending on how you view that outcome, 
it could serve to be probably the best avenue for uh, closure with respect to those three homicides. You could, you could also argue otherwise, and I'll get into that here in a second. But the practicality of him seeing any time outside of a prison is very minimal. I mean, he can, he can always at some point be eligible for parole down the road, yeah, which is which is a very minimal possibility. In his He'll 80s. be in his 80s, yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, that does give some hope. That's, I mean, as limited as it is, there's some hope that he could have some time uh, outside of prison after he serves his sentences. Um, is, that, is that something that uh, was considered by the district attorney's office? I'm sure it was. Uh, was that a factor involved in deciding uh, for the victims to go along with the plea, probably was talked about significantly. He has very good defense counsel, um, both of which I know and respect, and so I'm sure they've taken into account all aspects of it. I'm sure Mr. Bregman and his team um, and the prosecutor, uh, Ms. Mason, did a really good job in trying to put together the case and resolve um, by way of the most least resources expended and at the same time, saving the families from having to go through an emotional roller coaster a second and a third time in a trial. There are times where the prosecutors have a different agenda, and that is there is a deterrent factor uh, and a statement that needs to be made to the public, and that is we don't care whether 30 years is the outcome in the first trial. We're going to try them for the second and the third because there's more to it than this idea of a calculation. There is an idea that the community is owed a sense of responsibility and that he needs to own up t- to the homicides in a first degree fashion for number two and number three, right? Number two, and number three trials. So there is a distinct statement that could be made if you're convicted of all three in a first degree rather than plead the second and the third to second degrees. So I think there was an advantage to the defense in that matter. And if you look at it from that perspective, there are probably some that are concerned about the idea of a, a global plea in that respect. So I'm giving you both sides of what I believe to be kind of the, the talk. But I think overall, it's ultimately a decision between the families, the respective attorneys, and the prosecutors. You mentioned the overall sense of safety and how rattled that really was for the Muslim community you know, back in 2022. And I imagine it was, it's been a, a lengthy and grueling process just to get to this point where Syed you know, will serve time in prison. Now that he will, though, and he is going to stay in prison, is there an alleviated sense of safety, do you feel like, generally among, you know, friends? Great question. Um, I think that came about very early on when he was detained. Those times were really scary times, as we talked about. And I have to, I have to, I remember going back in time and how we put together an incredible force for investigating and bringing him to justice. It was an expedited process that probably is unprecedented in New Mexico. I mean, we've had everybody pulling, the FBI was there, APD. Uh, we had the then DA, Raul Torres. The governor was involved. The mayor was involved. We were t- speaking to DOJ back east. I was getting, quite frankly, and I've never said this publicly, but uh, Bill Richardson, former governor, former governor Richardson, God rest his soul, uh, I was getting advice from him and picking his brain about how I could mount a, a campaign to get everybody real excited about trying to get motivated to get this individual, whoever it was at the time, uh, detained. So there was a lot of great people behind the scenes working hard within the community. The turnaround was quick and the apprehension was quick, but it was also based on an effort by the community that laid out the ground piece for law enforcement in terms of that database of information. Remember when they set that up, APD? So I think everybody did a really good job in making sure that the right person was apprehended. And then when he was, it was an immediate sigh of relief to answer your question. And it brought some normalcy that began the process of getting better every day. So where we find ourselves here today is probably almost back to normal, still living with certain circumstances uh, of the event that motivates us to try to be safer with one another, try to look out for problems, and to be more vigilant with respect to our safety and safety of the community. But it's definitely a very welcome uh, emotion at this point. 
We'll be right back with more on New Mexico News Insiders. Hi, I'm Ann Perret, an investigative reporter in our KRQE Investigates unit. We are always working on something new right after it airs on KRQE. You can always find it on our website, krqe.com, or the next day on our KRQE YouTube channel. And now back to the New Mexico News Insiders. missing that you want to add or just want people to understand about the case or the community? I think it's a great uh, segue to what we anticipate coming next, right? And the sentencings are going to be scheduled, I think they are uh, coming up. It's going to be interesting to see whether the defense partakes in any vocalizing of... Because he hasn't yet. He has not. And a lot of times when defense defendants, they they exercise their right to remain silent, right? And that's their right. And through a plea deal, um, you are essentially secured, the sentencing is secured if the judge accepts the plea. And remember, the judge has to accept the plea or reject it 99% of the time, short of any good cause for rejecting it, they accept the plea. It's going to be interesting to see whether any statements are going to be made or anything further elaborated about motivations, about his mental health. We do know a lot through the investigation and through the the uh, period of time where this was um, this happened that there was potentially some significant either mental health issues because he was he was literally a, uh, someone that was trained by um, our forces in Afghanistan and combated the Taliban, and so he had that background. Um, but also this notion of potential domestic violence issues came up against his own family members and so on and so forth. So I wonder if any of that is going to come into play at sentencing or not. Yeah, and we know that the sentencing hearing is at this point slated for October 16th. Right. So in just about another month, um, we'll see if that unfolds. Yeah. Well, Mata Sanda, thank you so much for joining us. That's a pleasure always to be here. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Again, a big thanks to our reporter, Natalie Wadis, and Ahmad Assad, a local attorney and a prominent voice in the Muslim community, to talk about the conclusion here of the criminal cases that Muhammad Sayed has been charged for. Um, I think notably, that word closure is uh, subject to debate here. While there is closure Depending in the legal ask. sense, um, yeah, the, the idea of what happened, we still are um, missing, I think, a lot of answers. But think to Mr. Assad's point, maybe we will get those answers in sentencing next month. Again, that's October 16th, something we'll certainly pay attention to. Yeah, you can always follow us online at krqe.com. Our coverage of this case will continue and uh, stay tuned on our on our podcast platforms as well. We're now on the KRQE YouTube page and all your podcast platforms, as well as Wednesday nights at 1035 on Fox New Mexico. Yes, New Mexico News Insiders airs there in an abbreviated fashion. So we always encourage if you want to get the full conversation to check those out online in those platforms again. Yeah, and if you all have story ideas you'd like to send us, feel free to reach out. I'm Gabrielle.Burkhard at KRQE.com via email and GBurkNM on social media. And I'm Chris.McKee at KRQE.com, also at Chris McKee TV. Thanks for watching and listening.